my colleagues and me would like to warmly welcome you to this webinar about um, the congenital hyperindolinism. And we have planned the following structure for the following approximately 55 to 60 minutes. So I will start with a brief introduction. And this will be followed by um, an introduction into the pathophysiological concepts and the genetics behind congenital hyperinsulinism, which will be performed by Sebastian Kummer. Then Elena, Alena Baltas will, go, uh, will give an overview about the pharmacological treatment options. And then Oliver Blankenstein will provide information about established imaging techniques and new imaging options. And finally, Thomas Meissner will um, talk about the outcome of these affected patients. But first of all, I would like to start with a case, with a patient. And I would like to introduce you to Paul. Paul was born um, with um, 39 weeks of gestation. He had a normal body weight. And um, at the second day of his life, he started to get jittery. And the, pay, the parents had the impression that he's feeling uncomfortable. On the ward, blood glucose levels have been measured um, in the lower range, around 40 milligram per deciliter. And at the third day of life, Deja started, and therefore the colleagues performed um, an MRI scan, which was normal, and EEG examinations, which were also normal. But the problems remained, and the blood glucose level remained to be low. And therefore, it was a question, what should we do now? And um, to um, detect the correct diagnose and the reason for um, hypoglycemic episodes, it's of tremendous importance to perform a careful diagnostic workup. And one major step during this diagnostic steps is the blood collection during a hypoglycemic episode. Because most of the differential diagnosis could just be um, excluded or the diagnosis just could be made based on such a, it's called critical sample. And for example, in our clinic, um, we, uh, we put, uh, perform a lot, of, or we put a lot of effort into the education of the team at the e, um, e department. And there's, for example, um, a box which all the tubes which are necessary for this blood collection during the hypoglycemic episodes, if a, a patient presents there in, in the emergency department. And what you need to test is, for example, the glucose level and lactate. Then you need to measure during this hypoglycemia insulin and C-peptide and beta hydroxybutyric acid, or you can perform a ketone sticks. But if um, the patient is a neonate, you have to be aware that sometimes ketone levels could be low because the fasting interval wasn't long enough that uh, ketone bodies could be um, produced. Then you have to measure free fatty acids and hormones like growth hormone and cortisol. And you should measure amino acids and perform an acetylcarnine profile. Finally, organic acids, measurement in the urine and ammonia, ammonia concentration in the blood should be measured to get a full picture of the different parameters focusing on each differential diagnosis. In the case of Paul, and this is one major point for the diagnosis of congenital hyperinsulinism, insulin levels were measurable and um, during this hypoglycemic episode. And it's a bit an oversimplification, but every insulin level which is measurable during a hypoglycemic episode, and for the de definition, it should be above three milliunits per liter, this is pointing towards the diagnosis of hyperinsulinism because normally we all shouldn't produce any or secrete any insulin during a hypoglycemic episode. So once you measure insulin during hypoglycemia, the blood glucose levels should be low, at least below 45. It's much better if they are below 40. You should think about hyperinsulinism. Then there are a few um, other aspects for this diagnosis definition. So then, then is a um, additional glucose need. 
And uh, here a glucose infusion rate above 10 milligram per kilogram per minute might be one aspect for your diagnosis. And the ketone bodies um, need to be low during those hypoglycemic episodes. So the combination of insulin measurable during a hypoglycemic episodes, low ketone bodies will guide you to this disease and this diagnosis. Congenital hyperinsulinism is a rare disease, so it's approximately one in 40 to 50,000 um, individuals. Most of the patients um, have the, the first symptoms during the neonatal period, um, one third during the first year of life, and occasionally the symptom starts um, later than one year of age. But then if the patients are older, you need to think about other um, eater cell related diseases, which might be um, related, for example, to MEN1 or other diseases of the spectrum. Then congenital hyperindolism could be transient in a significant number of 60%. Then the symptoms on the glucose levels will improve over six to 12 weeks or it could be persistent. So we will now navigate you to, to all the diagnostic steps and treatment options. And we have started now with the patient with a glycemic episode. Um, it's really important to get this critical sample and the, in, the measurable insulin levels during hyperglycemic, during hyperglycemic episodes is one essential aspect to perform this diagnosis of congenital hyperinsulinism. And now I will pass the baton to Sebastian Kummer, who will provide further information about genetics and the genetic testing. Okay. Let's see. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks a lot for um, the introduction um, to Peter. Um, within the next few minutes, I'll be giving you a short overview about the pathophysiology and the genetics of congenital hyperinsulinism. Um, the list of genes um, that has been, have been named to be associated with hyperinsulinism has become quite long recently in recent years, um, some of them leading to monosymptomatic forms of um, congenital hyperinsulinism, some of them leading to hyperinsulinism in the context of syndromic diseases. And obviously, I won't be able to cover all of these today, but I'll try to give you some general overview about the um, to some general understanding of the importance of genetic testing in hyperinsulinism and its consequences for clinical management. And in this regard, especially about the um, genetic uh, forms of ABCC8 and KCNJ11 variants in hyperinsulinism. So first, to understand what um, leads to dysregulated insulin release, um, I would like to remind you of some basic principles of beta cell physiology. So what happens there is that glucose gets transported into the beta cell and then gets metabolized through different metabolic pathways into ATP. The ATP then acts on the ATP-sensitive potassium channel down here, which is coded by ABCC8 and KCNJ11, which we heard about before. Um, then the channel closes upon uh, ATP action over here, um, which leads to depolarization of the cell and calcium influx into the cell and then insulin exocytosis. Um, and uh, you can imagine that um, everything that disturbs this quite finely tuned balance over here might lead to um, insulin secretion disorders. And in this regard, CHI, is just, as a side remark, is just one example of a genetic um, form of insulin secretion disorders and quite closely related to MODI and neonatal diabetes, for example. Um, so um, what you can see over here already is that the um, target structure for diet oxide, which is the most important therapeutic agent that we use in, in congenital hyperinsulinism, um, the target structure is located exactly here. And you can imagine that if there are mutations in ABCC8 and KCNJ11, um, that might affect the responsiveness to diet oxide quite significantly over here. Um, next, um, there are um, two main patterns, it's a bit simplified, but you can imagine that there are two main patterns of pancreatic involvement in hyperinsulinism. So first, the diffuse disease, and second, the focal form of disease. With the diffuse disease, um, where all the pancreas is affected in the same way from the dysregulated insulin release, and in the focal form, there's just one single focus. Um, 
uh, causing the um, excess amount of insulin secretion while all the surrounding areas of the pancreas is, um, is not affected by the disease. And the um, uh, focality or the distribution pattern within the pancreas is affected by the genetic type of disease. So um, uh, patients having biallelic um, recessive mutations, so homozygous or compound heterozygous mutations affecting all the cells in the body in the same way, lead obviously to a similar involvement of each and every beta cell in the same way. And the same is the case for monoallelic and dominant mutations um, affecting um, each and every beta cell in the same way. For focal disease, um, you can imagine that there are monoallelic recessively acting mutations. So the single mutation on its own is not sufficient to explain hypersecretory phenotype of the beta cells, um, um, but they need a second hit. And if such monoallelic recessive variants occur in ABCC8 or KCNG11 on the paternal allele, this might lead to focal form of, of um, disease when the second hit affects the maternal allele. Um, what happens there in detail is that in the surrounding normal pancreatic tissue over here, you see that there's a, um, the um, defect paternal variant um, shown in red and the intact, so, so to say, compensating maternal variant over here. Um, and um, you have a quite finely tuned balance between um, maternally expressed growth suppressing genes um, and paternally expressed growth promoting gene, which is IGF-2. Um, Within the focus, um, the maternal area over here gets lost, and there's just the, the, the defect paternal area left over here. So the paternal um, variant in ABCC8 is reduced, so to say, to hemizygosity, um, and there's a loss of the maternal area of 11P, which causes that the growth suppressing genes get lost and the growth promoting paternally expressed genes, um, so to say, overweigh. And this leads to a hyperplasia of cells bearing exactly this form of dysregulated insulin secretion um, based on the ABCCA variant in this single focus within the pancreas. Um, the probability that such second hit or focal disease occurs in, in patients is approximately 0. 0.5 to 1% of those patients bearing a paternally inherited variant in ABCCA or KCNJ11. Um, so this um, lets you calculate a little bit the, the risk of, of recurrence in a second child for a specific family, for example. Um, so what's the frequency of different genetic causes in general? Um, there are two, page, two, two papers um, with really large published cohorts, one coming from the um, CHOP uh, hospital in Philadelphia in the United States, which is probably the largest hospital serving um, CHI patients worldwide, um, covering 417 children in this paper. And there's another cohort in, um, from the UK, um, published from the Exeter Group and the um, Great Ormond Street Group with uh, 300 patient, um, patients with congenital hyperinsulinism. And what's important to acknowledge is that um, the cohort composition is quite different between both publications. So in the left um, group, you have majority being adult oxide unresponsive, um, while in the UK cohort, most of the patients are adult oxide responsive. And um, in the Philadelphia group, um, most of the patients um, underwent surgical um, treatment, sorry, underwent surgical treatment over here. So approximately two thirds of the patients had surgery being done and only one third was being treated by medication alone. While in the UK court, um, the majority was treated medically and only a minority had surgery being done. Um, so it might uh, rela be related a little bit to the referral structures of dif different hospitals. So um, if you just get referred only the diets of site unresponsive, quite difficult to treat cases, for example, it might re reflect a little bit different therapeutic um, preferences of different hospitals or countries, um, st uh, different strategies um, uh, that has been used back then. However, um, you need to acknowledge that the courts are quite differently composed. And this is reflected um, by the composition of the genes. Um, so in children that are diet oxide responsive, um, and you wonder which gene might be the cause, it's a little bit dis disappointing that most of the children don't receive a specific genetic diagnosis. It might have improved a little bit since 2013 by, by improved uh, differential diagnosis approaches um, from a genetic point of view. It might have improved a little bit, but the problem is still that diet oxide responsive cases in, in many um, cases don't receive a specific genetic diagnosis. On the other hand, 
Um, and now it, the, the important uh, point comes re with regard to therapeutic relevance. In dioxide unresponsive children, um, the vast majority is caused by ABCC8 or KCNJ11 variants. And the same is true vice versa. So if you look at, at those patients having ABCC8 and KCNJ11 variants, the majority of those ones is um, unresponsive to dioxide treatment. And um, this is very important to know because then if you know that a dioxide unresponsive patient is likely to have a, a variant in ABCC8 or KCNJ11, you can try to predict if there might be likelihood of focal disease in such dioxide unresponsive patients. What you see here is that the majority on the left side, you see that the majority of patients with such monolelic recessive variants, so where um, uh, the parents and especially the father bears the same mutation but doesn't have any symptoms, um, if you have this constellation, then um, you can predict with the likelihood between, yeah, let's say, 70, a bit over 70% in the UK court or 90% in the Philadelphia court, you can predict with a high likelihood that it will be a focal kind of disease. And it's absolutely useful to, to have them um, um, done a PET scan and, and an option for surgery then. But what's also important is if you have dioxide unresponsive patients and no identifiable mutation, there's still a risk of or a chance of, let's say, 15% um, still having focal disease. So it makes still sense to make a PET scan in patients being dioxide unresponsive but not having a paternally inherited variant in ABCC8 or KCNJ11. So lastly, um, I want to talk um, just briefly about syndromic CHI. It has become aware within the last years that um, syndromic forms of CHI are quite frequent. Um, Kabuki syndrome um, has been published um, in, in quite large numbers in, um, within the, the last years. Turner syndrome, back with Wiedemann, has been mentioned by um, Peter already. Rubinstein Taibi has been published, I think, last year by Great Ormond Street and, and us. Um, so there are few syndromes that are known that can be associated with hyperinsulinism. So the key message um, taken from that is carefully watch out for further non-metabolic symptoms, stigmata, except the metabolic phenotype. Um, and in case there's anything to observe right there, include the syndromic forms of CHI in your differential diagnosis. Um, so lastly, practical approach. Um, what I want to say is that uh, genetic results may have significant impact on therapeutic approach, um, especially in, in those difficult cases which are dioxide unresponsive. Um, so it's absolutely useful and necessary to initiate genetic tests quite early. So what we do is as soon as we as we are confident that it's not an easy transient form of HI, um, we initiate the genetic tests. You should choose an experienced and fast genetic lab and you should aim for a rapid turnaround time of let's say 10 to 14 days until the result is available to, to facilitate the decision um, if um, surgical treatment is is um, is a reasonable option. And whenever possible, um, try to use next-gen sequencing um, with um, comprehensive CHI panel right from the beginning, if possible and feasible, because it just um, facilitates to have a really broad differential diagnosis of the potential causes. If not, you can start with ABCC8 and KCNG11 to, to answer the question regarding focality and, and option of surgical approach, um, and then do next-gen afterwards. But when possible and achievable, you just can try to achieve next and sequencing right in front. Okay, that's from my side, and I'll hand over to Alina. Thank you, good afternoon. So I will proceed giving you um, an overview of the medical treatment of congenital hyperinsulinism. I will try to outline the challenges we encounter when treating a child with CHI. I will highlight the pros and cons of the different drugs, and then I will finish showing you how we at our treatment centers approach the child with severe recurrent hypoglycemia. So what drugs do we have to manage CHI? There's of course glucagon, which can be given as a bolus in case of an acute hypoglycemic episode, but which can also be continuously infused. Glucagon of course acts on the liver and directly raises blood glucose concentrations. Then on the other side, there are a couple of drugs that primarily act on the beta cell to inhibit insulin release. So these include the KTP channel opener diazoxide, the somatostatin analogs, for example, octreotide and lanreotide, the calcium channel antagonist nifedipine, and then more recently, the M2 inhibitor has been introduced. 
However, this dioxide is the only drug approved for the long-term management of CHI, and as we have just learned, it is often not effective in infants with KTP channel mutations. And although the, the use of somatostatin analogs and also continuous glucagon infusions are uh, yeah, well established um, in the management of CHI and also regularly used in our hands, this is neither true for the calcium channel antagonist nifedipine nor for the mTOR inhibitor Zirolimus. So, although in theory it makes sense to use calcium channel antagonists, we consider nifedipine as not being effective and that's why we are not using this medication at our treatment centers. Some centers do use Zirolimus as, yeah, I would say, a last line of defense. However, it has a very risky side effect profile and also limited efficacy, as I will show you later, and that's why we are also not using this medication at our treatment centers. So, what basically remains are three medications for the long-term management of CHI, of which only one is approved for treatment of CHI, which however is often not effective. And then furthermore, since there's only limited data on the long-term efficacy and safety of these drugs, many treatment decisions are often based on single center experience, and um, this of course makes it extremely difficult to counsel the affected families. So I'll proceed giving you uh, a bit more detailed information on the different drugs. As I said already, glucagon cannot only be given as a bolus, but it can be continuously infused. We frequently do this um, via a subcutaneous catheter, as shown here on the right-hand side. And as such, glucagon for us is an extremely important medication for the initial stabilization of blood glucose, particularly to avoid fluid overload if the glucose, infu if the glucose infusion rate is very high. Unfortunately, there are several aspects that impede the use of glucagon in CHI. So, it has a very short half-life, that is of course why it needs to be continuously infused, and above that it tends to spontaneously polymerize and to form fibrils, and that is why glucagon infusions are often complicated very frequently by catheter obstructions, and that is why continuous glucagon infusion is not really workable as a home therapy. However, the good news is that there are novel soluble and stable glucagon analogs under clinical investigation, for example, daziglucagon, which can be infused via an insulin pump. And also um, long-acting glucagon formulations have been developed that can be administered once a week. Glucagon generally is a very safe medication. There have been reports on a very rare but severe side effect termed erythema necrotica migrans. So one should pay particular attention on skin lesions when treating a child with glucagon. As soon as the diagnosis is established um, and the child is more or less stabilized on glucagose and glucagon, we would initiate the treatment with diazoxide. So diazoxide was initially developed as an antihypertensive drug, but it was soon noted that it increases blood glucose concentrations, and that is why it was already introduced as a treatment for CHI in the 1960s. When treating a child with CHI uh, with diazoxide, it's important to keep in mind that diazoxide has a very long half-life of 6 to 28 hours, so you should be aware that it may take a couple of days until a, a response can be observed. There are several or different approaches how to initiate a child on diazoxide. We typically start with a rather low dose ranging from approximately 5 to 7.5 milligrams per kilogram per day divided in two to three doses. And then we would gradually increase the dose until a response can be observed and other drugs, for example, glucagose, glucagon or glucose, can slowly be tapered off. Uh, another approach would be to start right away with a higher dose of dioxide. This, of course, allows a faster switch to an alternative medication uh, in case the child does not respond to dioxide. However, at the same time, of course, the risk of um, side effects is increased when you start right away with a higher dose of dioxide. If a child does not respond to the maximum doses of dioxide um, over a period of three days, then we would consider this child as being diazoxid uh, resistant. So if the child, uh, sorry, um, the dioxide um, is as well generally well tolerated. The most um, common side effect, um, which in our experience can be observed in every patient dose dependently, is hypertrichosis, as shown here on the right side. However, the most um, relevant um, side effect um, of dioxide is fluid retention and edema, which is, um, can be related to the diuretic effect of diazoxide. And that is why some centers was re would recommend to directly combine diazoxide treatment with a diuretic, so for example, with chlorothiazid, HCT. Then there are a couple of 
yeah, less severe side effects, I would say, including appetite suppression, neutropenia, thrombocytopenia, and hyperuricemia. And then there have been reports on a very severe but also rare side effect, pulmonary hypertension. So there's a very nice review from our colleagues from the CHOP Center um, in Philadelphia. And they noted that up to 2.5% of their infants treated with thioxide um, developed pH. And what they also noted that all of these infants were either premature or had um, cardiac or respiratory comorbidities predisposing them to the development of pH. So particular attention should be paid in this patient group. And they also noted, noted that those infants that develop pH had a delayed diuretic initiation. So we would also recommend that if you have a child that has a risk factor for the development of pH to directly combine dioxide treatment with HCT, so with the diuretic. And then very recently, there have been reports on the development of NEC under treatment with dioxide. So there has been a report from Canada from neonatal ICU patients. And they observed that their infants had a five-fold increased risk um, to develop NEC when they were treated with dioxide. These infants as well tended to be younger, tended to have a lower birth weight, a lower gestational age, and were all uh, also uh, more often SGA. So again, a particular attention should be paid in this patient group. So on this background, this is uh, the routine checkup that we would perform on our infant that are treated with dioxide. If a child does not or does not sufficiently respond to dioxide, then we would initiate treatment with a zomatostatin analog. So zomatostatin had already been proven to be effective in CHI in 1977. It binds to several types of somatostatin receptors, which are not only found within the pancreas, but which are expressed uh, throughout the gastrointestinal tract and also uh, in the pituitary gland. Um, somatostatin inhibits insulin release via several different mechanisms by binding particularly to the somatostatin receptor 5. The problem with somatostatin itself is that it has a very short half-life, so it needs to be continuously infused. And that is why, of course, these analogs have been developed with a um, prolonged half-life that can be administered um, four to, um, every four to six hours in case of octreotide, for example, or every four to six weeks in, um, uh, in the case of lanreotide. If we start, start a child on a somatostatin analog, we would typically initiate um, with a test dose of 10 micrograms per kilograms, which can then be gradually increased. And um, there is um, unfortunately a common side effect of octreotide, which is tachyphylaxis, which is due to the internalization of somatostatin receptors. So that's why the dose um, often needs to be increased initially. And it has been suggested by um, some centers to that this can be avoided by um, giving only two doses of octreotide, one in the morning and one in the afternoon, and then bridge the time in between uh, with continuous overnight feeds. Somatostatin analogs as well are uh, well tolerated in general. As I said, these somatostatin receptors are also expressed throughout the gastrointestinal tracts, so it's not surprising that they can cause transient gastrointestinal symptoms, for example, um, abdominal discomfort, diarrhea, or fatty stock. What we observe quite frequently is uh, cholelithiasis or biliary sludge. So we would um, start infants right away with ozodeoxycholic acid to prevent um, the formation of gall gall uh, gallstones. Um, following the injection of lanreotide, we often observe induration nodules at the injection site, so it's recommended to switch the injection site. And um, since somatostatin analogs also uh, inhibit the release of growth hormone from the pituitary gland, there have been concerns regarding the growth velocity, and there have been sporadic reports on, however, a mild and transient impairment in growth velocity in infants treated with somatostatin analogs. An elevation in liver enzymes appears to be quite common in infants treated with um, long-acting somatostatin analogs, so there has been a report um, from our colleagues in the Netherlands in 2018, and they observed that up to 39% um, uh, of infants developed um, um, elevations in liver enzymes, enzymes when treated with um, somatostatin analogs. The most severe uh, um, uh, side effect observed um, under treatment with somatostatin analogs is NEC. I've been looking a bit um, more 
in detail into the literature, you will notice that most of the infants that developed NAC were newborns or had uh, comorbid conditions that predisposed these infants to the development of NAC, and mostly these infants were treated already within the first month of life. So that is why we would recommend to avoid, if somehow possible, the use of somatostatin analogs in neonates, particularly, of course, if additional risk factors for NAC are present. And we uh, routinely measure height, growth factors, thyroid function, liver enzymes um, every six months, and also perform an ultrasound every six months. And finally, I will give some information on Zirolimus. Um, so as I said, we are not using this medication. Um, at our institutions, um, so in 2014, there has been the first report on the successful use of sirolimus in four infants with severe hyperendemic hypoglycemia, and this has, of course, generated great enthusiasm. However, ever since there have been concerns regarding um, yeah, side effects and also efficacy, and um, in 2018, there was an observational study on 10 infants treated with sirolimus, and these authors noted that only 30% of infants responded to the rolimus at the expense of very severe side effects, including anemia, sepsis, and stomatitis, which was in fact the most common side effect observed. So, and um, this is why many centers today consider that there is not enough evidence um, to, so to support the use of the rolimus in infants um, with CHI. To show you, um, I'm, I'm, I would like to try to bring all this information together in a suggested treatment approach. Um, so I, I will tell you what we would suggest how to treat a child with CHI. So um, the first um, or the, the immediate goal, of course, must be to rapidly um, stabilize blood glucose concentrations uh, in order to prevent hypoglycemic brain damage. So for this, you will need, of course, uh, large amounts of additional carbohydrates, which can be infused and uh, also given um, uh, to the infant formula. At the same time, however, you need to avoid fluid overload. And that is why we um, would typically start an infant very fast uh, on a co continuous uh, glucagon infusion. And um, uh, in case of an acute hypoglycemic episode, you can, of course, give the child 40% dextrose gel, for example, or an additional glucagon bolus. Um, as soon as the diagnosis is established, we would start the child on uh, diazoxide. As I said, we would start with a rather slow doses and then would gradually increase the dose until a response can be observed. You should be aware um, that um, um, diazoxide can induce fluid overload and edema and pulmonary hypertension. So you should consider the use of a diuretic, particularly in infants that have additional risk factors for um, pulmonary hypertension. As we've learned just from the Bastian, um, the genetic result has um, uh, a huge uh, um, uh, impact on the um, following therapeutic approach. So we would recommend you to already at this time initiate genetic testing. If a child does not respond to diadoxide, we would initiate um, a somatostatin analog, so typically octreotide. You should be aware that octreotide increases the risk for NAC. And we believe that um, octreotide treatment should be limited for specialized centers. So we would highly encourage you to contact us or other experts in the field, in the field if you feel that your child does not sufficiently respond to diazoxide and you would want him um, to start with octreotide. Um, then over time, one may consider, of course, to switch to a long-acting uh, somatostatin analog, so for example, lanreotide. And again, we would encourage you here to consult with experts. During all steps, of course, we combine medical therapy with the nutritional therapy, for example, by adding glucose polymers such as maltodextrin or glucosade to the uh, infant formula. However, you should keep in mind that, um, of course, the carbohydrate needs um, exceeds nutritional needs in infants with CHI, and that um, pushing a child um, to eat more than it requires um, removes hunger and paves the way for feeding disorder. So if you have a child that responds to medication, then we would recommend to increase the dose if this is still possible, um, rather than to overfeed the child in order to really maintain oral feeds in children with CHI. And then if all this is not enough, of course, um, there's good news that there are some experimental therapies on the way, as I've just mentioned, for example, Dazi glucagon, the soluble glucagon formulation, which can hopefully be um, yeah, continuously infused um, in the future via uh, insulin pumps, for example. And then I would like to hand over to Oliver Blankenstein.
Yes. Thank you very much, Alina, for this very nice and um, broad overview. And um, now we are um, in the situation coming back to Peter's patient where we try treatment and maybe we just suppose it's a dioxide res non-responding. And the question is what to do now. We um, may have genetic situation here. And um, so we do have, as Sebastian has shown us, the genetic findings. Um, and we know um, either it's a genetically proven diffuse, so we have to go with Alena the whole way until we find something which may control the blood sugars, or we can go to the, um, we are in the group of the potential focal or unknown patients, and then we come to the issue of nuclear imaging um, to um, just differentiate whether a patient has a non-focal or focal type of disease, which is, um, as you can see, an important step here because it differentiates between the medication therapy or surgical therapy. And um, the nuclear imaging is nuclear imaging because it's PETs can diagnostic. So you have a radioactive marked substance with, which will um, be injected into the child. And then you can look at the distribution of this uh, tracer substance in an imaging scale. And this can be combined with other imaging technologies like MRI or um, CT. Um, we are the first PET scans with um, 18 fluoride dopa was made in 2001 in Toko, Finland, and um, it showed a superior performance um, um, nowadays compared to the older localization methods as pancreas venous sampling, which was a very well, blood thirsty and very long and dangerous thing or calcium stimulation test. It's non-invasive, it's fast, there is uh, less radiation than when you do pancreas venous sampling, and there's the highest sensitivity and specificity we can get in this disease. And nowadays, it's a gold standard for localization diagnostic or differentiation between focal and non-focal. In the literature, there are more of 400 than 400 cases reported. Although, well, not all cases done have been reported. Um, I think our experience goes near 400 cases as well, but not all have been published. And in total, the sensitivity to um, discriminate between focal and non-focal disease is between 67 100% depending on the publication and the specificity. So if something um, has been um, decided as a focal looking picture, whether it was truly a focal disease is between 90 and 100%. The radiation dose is 0.4 millisievert, which is only for the PET scan, which is very low. It's much lower than a yearly standard um, radiation dose all over the world, but usually when you combine it with a CT scan, it, there are coming additional five to eight millisievert on top. Um, so um, when in combination, for example, with MRI, the radiation um, exposure is not a really um, problem. What we have to um, think about when we look at the data is, there is a significant inclusion bias in all published data. So the number of published studies where every patient with, with hypoglycemia was included and received uh, um, imaging, there is no study. All the studies have a pre-selection and in any study, the pre-selection is different. That is in part the reason as Sebastian already has shown in the US they are doing different things than in the UK. 
and they include different patients. So we don't know whether maybe some of the so-called transient hyperinsulinism cases might be focal because none of them have ever received a PET scan and uh, or, or at least not systematically and um, so and we don't know about false negative rates because um, not in all cases where diffuse um, CHI have been found, there have been surgery or, or um, uh, tissue samples taken to differentiate. But that's what you do because we are working in small children and this is an ethical concern. So the goal and added value of our high resolution nuclear imaging is um, to improve um, the quality resolution and resolution information to fulfill the needs of the surgeon. So in the end, if there is a focal disease, we want to make it easier for the surgeon to find the focus. So we are trying to detect structures on two millimeters. Um, we are trying to localize the focus exactly on the millimeter using guide points um, which are visible for the surgeons and to enable the surgeon to find the focus. And we try to display all important structures. That's why we are using high resolution images as a second imaging technology. And the, the, the final goal is to reduce the surgical trauma in the patient. So this is such a picture, it's a very nice picture. You can see it's a DOPA pad where we have some uptake in the liver, we'll come to the back and the whole pancreas is um, enhanced in the same, more or less the same intensity. So this is a typical diffuse picture. When we come to focal diseases, these are more, more um, technology work pictures. You can see here, which is a focal disease in the tip of the tail. And we can see the, the background upgrade in the pancreatic tissue. This is this 3D reconstruction. Here you have all the kidneys and uh, the important vessels. So it's easy to, to understand that it may be easier for the surgeon to find the focus if you have a, such a kind of picture available. But, there are limits in the usual DOPA PET in congenital hyperinsulination. One of them is the interpretation in such small children needs a lot of experience because the standard instrumentation is not optimized for very small children and very small structures. The other thing, I will show you the data in the next slide, is that very large foci are represented too small. The third thing is the pattern of a DOPA PET scan changes with age. So in a very small newborn baby or infant, it is very homogeneous if you have a focal disease. But when you look and do another PET scan two years later, it will be blotchy. And there are people out there in the world who um, believe that this may be a representation of um, kind of focalization of the disease, but in truth, there are in the older patient, not all beta cells are working at the same time. Some of them are in a way for a time silent. And when you would have done a PET scan 10 minutes later, another beta cell islet would blob up. And so the localization of the foci leaves additional room for improvement. And so we do see the clinical need for new molecular tracers to overcome these problems. Just a few data. Um, if you have very large foci, um, this is uh, the, the surgical picture. All this region of the pancreas has been focal area. But what we have seen in the PET scan was only a very, very small picture of the focus. And most part of the focus was invisible in the um, PET scan. And this seems to apply to all um, focal lesions, which are larger than 30% of the whole pancreatic tissue. The next thing is um, the, Experiencing, so you see this looks like a diffuse thing, but when you look here close to the kidney, 
there is a dot which might be another, well, nephron um, with high intensity, but in truth, it is a tip of the tail focus, which can easily be oversee, overlooked when um, you don't have the necessary um, experience. So the interpretation of neonatal PET is dependent on experience and not everyone who has a theoretical possibility to do it is, has this qualification to do it in the needed quality. So one picture for new PET tracers, what we are trying to do together with an EU funded and thing with um, the colleagues from Nijmegen, which developed this tracer, is that we are using um, gallium exendin instead of fluidopa, which has a technical um, advantage because um, fluorization of nuclear tracers is a very difficult chemical process, and it's easier to 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 use um, gallium than than fluorine. And uh, what we can see here is that we can see the focus at least in the same intensity and quality on both sides. Maybe it's even a little bit more intense on the extending picture. And for us, the important thing is you don't have any liver uptake with extending. So mm -hmm. this tracer can be used for what we call teranostic use. So we can use it for intersurgical procedures to find um, the focus with um, a positron probe using this tracer when it's injected um, during the surgical procedure. This patient was cured after we used this technology. No. Um, this patient was cured in the end, and what we can see to in in comparison with with extending to dopa is when we use a so-called specific uptake value. It looks like that extending discriminates better than fluidopa. Um, and for now, we have 15 cases in our center. Uh, where we did this successful radio guided surgery technology. And this is, now comes the picture. This is a positron probe using in open surgery. And here on the monitor, you can see the counts and from the calculation of the counts, you can really see and hear where the focus is. And this is a big help for the surgeon if you can see the focus microscopically. Um, coming to surgery in um, congenital hyperinsulinism, well, in focal forms, it's well established. The outcome is 90 to 97% of the patients are cured after surgery. And um, we should, in the future, prefer technologies with the least loss of healthy, healthy tissue. So don't do quadrant resection, but try to get to go for enucleation of the focus. For the non-focal forms, there is only, well, the only data available is that the subtopital pancreatectomy leads to 100% type 3 diabetes 10 years later. And in some cases, it leads to exocrine pancreatic insufficiency on the long term. In the short-term outcome, so a few weeks or months after surgery, about 40 to 60% of the patients who had surgery in non-focal disease would still be hypoglycemic and need medication. 30% of the patients after this kind of surgery had diabetes, so already had the total endocrine insufficiency. And only 10 to 20% of the patients are euglycemic after surgery, but they will later on with 100% develop diabetes. So you change one disease to the other. And a surgical cure by the mechanism of disease is more or less impossible. And then there is a question of so-called atypical forms. And I will answer this question with another question. Do they exist? We don't have a pathophysiologic mechanism how those so-called atypical forms may 
be developed. So the, the only mechanism known is that we can have a, a distal or proximal accumulation of hyperactive cells. Um, and this might be related to the ventral and dorsal um, nucleus of the beta cells and which is important in the pancreatic development. So this is the end of my talk. Um, now we have seen all the things we talked about, the diagnostic thing, we talked about genetic, we talked about pharmacological treatment, about imaging and surgery, and now the important question, what is the result? And now I'm happy to introduce Thomas Meissner for the outcome section. Yeah, welcome colleagues um, from Düsseldorf again. And um, my topic is the neurological outcome. And um, 20 years ago, this was very bad. Uh, this is a slide from Okay, so this is the start of my talk, I'm sorry. Um, the neurological outcome. Um, 20 years ago, um, the outcome um, was um, very bad. A lot of patients were severely handicapped and um, um, this was improving with diagnostic procedures with new therapeutic um, options. Um, however, um, the neuro neurodevelopmental outcome is um, still bad in congenital hyperinsulinism. And as you see in this study from Britain, um, this is not only true for um, persistent hyperinsulinism, um, but also for the transient um, CHI form, which um, affects the uh, patients for only um, six to eight weeks. And even in this group, we find um, severely affected patients with um, brain damage. The, uh, these are two pictures um, from our institution. On the left side, you see a patient um, with transient hyperinsulinism, and you see the um, severe brain damage um, here um, and overall in the MRI. And, um, the other case um, is a patient with a persistent hyperinsulinism, and you also see that um, there's a lot of fluid around the brain and um, you see a lot of brain damage in this patient with um, yeah, severe hyperinsulinism. And um, both patients um, suffered from a severe developmental delay and they both um, have an epilepsy. And um, we asked ourselves, um, why do we still see this severe brain damage in, in our patients? And um, my colleague uh, Marcel Röper um, did a detailed study of the medical records of, um, of the patients that um, were in our institution and um, we tried to identify red flags. So red flags for um, abnormal um, new developmental outcome. And um, what she found was that um, being um, born abroad was a risk factor a delay of more than 12 um, hours between the first symptoms of hypoglycemia and the first blood glucose measurements. Hypoglycemic seizures were um, a risk factor and um, very low um, glucose concentrations in the um, group with severe brain damage. Um, the median glucose concentration was about 12 compared to the normal development group where the lowest glucose concentration at a um, median of 20. So this demonstrated what we were thinking that early diagnosis and prompt adequate treatment are essential for an improved outcome um, of patients with congenital hyperinsulinism. And um, as Elena told before, um, in a patient as Paul, the patient presented by Peter, um, you start usually with a glucose infusion. And um, this will be not sufficient um, because a peripheral infusion is not enough um, glucose um, generally to treat hyperinsulinism and then you need um, glucagon uh, subcutaneous infusion or you need a central line in most patients to give high dosage um, um, of glucose and um, we really need um, this escalation steps to become um, more 
um, quickly in um, the regimen in, that is mainly covered by neonatologists because um, in the beginning nobody um, thinks about congenital hyperinsulinism if a patient has um, severe hypoglycemia. And the reason for this is um, um, a picture you can see here. Um, this is a GLOW study from New Zealand and you see the postnatal glucose curves in healthy term neonates and what the colleagues demonstrated is that even in those healthy neonates, interstitial glucose is um, lower than 36 milligram per deciliter in about 25% of patients. So with continuous glucose measurements, one of four patients has this um, glucose concentration lower than 36. However, um, if you look at um, the glucose concentration of 27 milligram per deciliter, this is very rare. Um, so, um, I think it's important um, if the glucose concentration is lower than 27, then you have to consider um, more severe um, hypoglycemia um, situation. And you should think um, about um, congenital hyperinsulinism in a transient or persistent form. So how to avoid brain damage in, new, in newborns with um, hyperinsulinism in the future? I think if the patients are in our centers and we have um, um, the measures um, to protect them from further brain damage, but the initial situations, the first days of life, of life are critical. And the problem is that congenital hyperinsulinism is a very rare disease um, with a high rate of brain damage. However, we have transient neonatal hypoglycemia, which is very, very common. Um, it affects about 15% of all newborns, and this is about 100 and, uh, 120,000 patients a year in Germany, for example. So the open question is um, how to diagnose CHI patients early in the frequent setting of neonatal hypoglycemia. And I think we can do this um, if you combine this with um, the um, management of transitional neonatal hypoglycemia because recent data, I will present this in the next slide, show us that there are, those patients are also at risk for mild brain damage. And um, the data are um, new and um, there are not enough information at the moment, but um, I think this is important. So today, there's no clear evidence of, for the treatment thresholds of neonatal hypoglycemia and guidelines therefore differ worldwide. And even in, within one country as Germany, we have um, completely different um, treatment protocols. So to the question of transitional neonatal hypoglycemia and neurological impairment, I will show you a study that was published in 2019. This was a systematic review. And um, the group from New Zealand demonstrated that um, based on the literature, we find a two to three fold increase in um, non, in sp of specific cognitive deficits. Um, and these are uh, found um, <clears throat> not at uh, the age of two years usually, but at the age of five to, to 10 years. And um, the, there are only a few studies. And the conclusion of my um, talk now is that I think we really need um, evidence-based guideline for transitional hypoglycemia and congenital hyperinsulinism, a guideline that um, really um, is safe for both groups of patients with no overtreatment um, in the patient with transitional neonatal hypoglycemia, but with a good um, escalation, intensivation of therapy if a patient has signs of um, severe hypoglycemia um, and is suffering con of congenital hyperinsulinism. I think this is a way to um, improves the neurological outcome of those patients in future. So with this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, I hope you um, realize that congenital hyperinsulinism is a really heterogeneous disease with many genetic defects and the clinical curse is completely different in those patients. And we are always really happy if um, um, you contact us um, and I think you can contact your colleague in your um, country because um, we cannot um, cover all aspects um, of treatment and we also um, are not always sure how to approach in a patient with congenital hyperinsulinism because this might be really a challenge um, if they are not responsive to diet 
the Dietsox site. So really um, feel free to contact us and uh, thank you very much for the attention. And I think the session is- We shortly discuss is, what do you do when you in a, however level hospital with, with not a dedicated center as a newborn with high glucose demand, low blood sugars, which is difficult to treat, which are the very important things to do. Um, I think this is something we maybe can discuss together to just line it out for the audience. Yes, in my opinion, the most important thing is um, to see um, this is not a normal case. If you have a hypoglycemia like 20 milligram per deciliter or 15, 10 milligram per deciliter, and you give IV glucose and the patient is going up to 30 and then going back to 20, then this is a critical situation. Um, so what you need is immediate glucose control um, after 15 to 30 minutes if you have severe hypoglycemia, and then to increase the glucose infusion rate to give bolus um, glucose um, um, if necessary, and um, really to go very fast to the step um, to use glucagon in such a situation um, if the peripheral glucose infusion is not sufficient to pro, um, provide good, uh, sufficient glucose concentrations. I think that's so think... my point, the first step, and um, maybe you can continue. <laughs> I think we we all agree that um, in a neonate that glucagon should be after just dextrose the first line of medical treatment before starting with diazoxide because diazoxide is too slow for to saving the brain and the first thing is save the brain um, and the other thing if we have audience from different countries. The most important thing is measuring blood sugar in the um, in the um, in every newborn. So um, and and any symptomatic small child in the first weeks of life should be have first of all the blood sugar me measured. And then the question would be when to call someone else. To, to take contact to an expert, the first day or after two weeks or whenever? Maybe we can come to the questions in the, in the, side, um, in the sidebar. Um, if lanreotide is not available, any role of long-acting octreotide, any age specific? Oliver, I think this is a question for you. <laughs> um, well, everybody has to deal with what he has on its hand. And actually, um, the, as far as I aware, the side effects of the traditional um, long acting as a sandosatin LIR are more frequent side effects reported than with uh, zomatoline. Lanreotide. I don't know the reason, um, but if you don't have lanreotide but you have octreotide, I think then you should try to do use an insulin pump for continuous um, octreotide um, infusion uh, to to maybe get a similar effect. And and the important thing is to to get the blood sugar stabilized overnight when um, the parents need their sleep. And the second question for those being non dietoxide responder after the initiation of somatostatin analogs, do we keep the dietoxide or wean it off? Maybe I can answer that. Um, usually, if we if we have a clear uh, non responder, um, then we would uh, stop the dietoxide in the, um, at the same moment when we identify it as a non responder, um, because it doesn't make sense to uh, really um, risk side effects in the situation where we don't have any clear effect. Um, but still, it's reasonable to observe the blood glucose in the following three to five days if there's any minor effect uh, becoming visible after stopping diet oxide. But it's, um, if it is a clear non-responder, it doesn't make sense to go on with diet oxide at this situation. And you don't need to wean it off, you just can drop it because yeah. there's no effect and there's no, no reason to slowly wean it off. 
Um, and and even if there is what we call partial responsiveness, you will better see that if you just stop the medication than if you wean. So it's in both limits, it's easier. And then a third question um, for recurrent severe hypoglycemia, either transient or um, congenital hyperinsulinism, do you recommend brain imaging MRI to predict the neurodevelopmental outcome? Um, probably a question for Thomas. And if yes, when? <laughs> You're mute. Um, this is a very good question because uh, we don't have a standard um, for um, the MRI in um, patients with congenital hyperinsulinism. This is really, really something we should um, work on. Um, I think um, it might be helpful to um, identify brain damage or to see um, no brain damage um, in patients with congenital hyperinsulinism for um, talking to the parents about um, what they might expect in future. But um, we have to be very careful with our prognosis because um, um, I showed you slides with uh, severe brain damage and the patients develop um, um, better than expected, um, I think. Um, so um, we have no consequences um, from um, the MRI um, in terms of um, treatment, but um, in terms of um, support, for example, phys um, physical therapy um, introduction um, may be maybe, um, something you do if you see a patient with uh, um, brain damage, um, you will start this earlier. But um, the um, answer is that we don't have to do it. Um, we don't have uh, therapeutic options um, as a result of um, the MRI. And we do it at six weeks, about six weeks of nine. Other questions? I, I don't see the question. No more questions left on the sidebar. No, uh, for the moment, uh, the, all the questions are covered. Uh, uh, maybe want... I can ask you a question. Um, if you send you a patient, um, are you doing both now uh, in terms of a study? Is it X and D and the DOPA um, PET? Or? Sorry, you are mute. mute. We do. Peter already answered, we do, but we have reasons. First of all, we want to see if there may be um, B focal diseases, which we might miss with only one of them. And, um, and we want to see if there are, because when we look at the mechanism of the tracer, the DOPA PET is the intracellular activity tracer. And the um, exendine PET is an extracellular receptor patient. So we have an anatomical and a functional marker. And to compare those two, um, we think in the long term, maybe we can learn something from it and to differentiate. But it's uh, the numbers are too low now to really try to do uh, to to make conclusions. But we decide, as in any focal case, we do, and in the diffuse cases, we think maybe there is a focal case disease in the other tracer. And the last few cases, we always decided better be safe than sorry, and it's the second one as well. <laughs> for your attention, for discussion. Thank you for joining and um, take care. And I think the most important message is early diagnosis will save maybe more brains than better therapy later, but we still 